So it's now time for a question period. The member from Bruce. My question is for the Premier. Premier, your government has recently been holding consultations on Ontario's climate change strategy, which is really just a cover for your upcoming carbon tax. A price on carbon will increase the cost of everything, from gas to groceries. And Premier, we already have received over 13,000 signatures on the PC Stop the Carbon Tax petition. Premier, my question for you is this. Will you listen to the people of Ontario and say no to a carbon tax? Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Environment and Climate Change is going to want to weigh in on it. <laughs> but I'm just going to, I'm going to take a crack at it to start out with. You know, Mr. Speaker, I think that it is, uh, it is not underestimating the issue to say that climate change is a defining issue of our time. There is, there is probably no issue that is more important for all of us to tackle. And, Mr. Speaker, I would go further to suggest that this is not a partisan issue. This is, this is an issue that is going to affect all of us, that is going to affect our children and our grandchildren, Mr. Speaker. And we have done a lot in Ontario by shutting down the coal-fired plants, Mr. Speaker. We have made an enormous, enormous step forward. But the fact is that there is more to be done. There is more that we have to do if we are going to be responsible to generations to come, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to do that. Back to the Premier. Speaker, I heard the Premier say there's no issue, issue they want to tackle. I think she meant to say tax, uh -huh. because really and truly, Ontarians already have some of the highest energy costs in North America, and a carbon tax will only further drive jobs out of this province. Premier, it is unacceptable that your Minister of Energy has nonchalantly stated businesses come and go. But, Premier, we definitely don't want a carbon tax Where to speed up that process, driving jobs out of this province, especially when other jurisdictions, such as B.C., saw a carbon tax increase the cost of farmers an extra $4,300, and in Australia, it raised energy by 9 per cent. Premier, will you heed the advice of the PC Party of Ontario and commit to not implementing a carbon tax? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think that the uh, the member opposite might look at other jurisdictions, even in this country. Mr. Speaker, she might look at BC, she might look at Quebec, she might look at Alberta, Mr. Speaker, and see that there are other jurisdictions in this country that have moved forward responsibly. She then might look at other jurisdictions internationally, Mr. Speaker. She might look at Sweden. She might look at where the opportunities have been increased because there has been a regime of carbon pricing. But apart from all of that, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that we cannot sit idle. We cannot pretend that this is not an issue. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, there are people in every one of our ridings who are concerned about the fact that they're seeing changing weather patterns, Mr. Speaker. They know that they don't have a federal government that is moving. Order. No, no. I'm getting order so she can finish and I can hear. Please finish. They know that they don't have a federal government that is putting in place a framework Answer. and that it is up to the provincial governments to work together to make sure that we take here, here. responsible yeah. steps for future generations, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Final and get back to the Premier. Speaker, Ontarians are concerned about the cost of living and the cost of doing business going through the roof. And Premier, back to you. In last year's election, the only thing you said to the people of Ontario about a carbon tax is that you won't implement one. Oh. Premier, as the second of our five budget asks, will you stick by what you said to the people of Ontario and commit in your 2015 budget that you will not put another burden on taxpayers' shoulders by levying a carbon tax? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Alberta, I want to say it really slowly, Alberta has a price on carbon introduced by the same party she's affiliated with, Mr. Speaker. British Columbia, which has seen some of the most dynamic per capita GDP growth in Canada, has a price on carbon, Mr. Speaker. Quebec, 
has a price on carbon, Mr. Speaker. California has a price on carbon, Mr. Speaker. New York has a price on carbon, Mr. Speaker. Massachusetts has a price on carbon, Mr. Speaker. Mexico has a price on carbon. They're all seeing. China has a price on carbon. Germany and that. What Could the member explain her party's position, how she reduces GHG emissions, how she thinks that Ontario yes, can be the only jurisdiction to reduce it without a price on carbon, Mr. Speaker? Because that's fantasy. Thank you. New question. The member from Wednesday, Nicholson, Pembroke. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, we're just coming off one of the coldest winters on record, and the consequences of your reckless hydro policies are more apparent than ever. Most Ontarians are struggling because the cost of energy is rising much faster than their ability to pay. This is because they're paying 14 cents a kilowatt hour, plus all the extras you slap on, like the global adjustment, debt retirement charge, and distribution costs for on peak electricity. When your government took office, they were paying 4.3 cents a kilowatt hour. Premier, the current chaos in the energy system is all on you. The only way to fix it is to change direction. Will you turn away from your failed energy policies, which have damaged our economy and caused untold misery to ratepayers, and commit to making Ontario once again an energy competitive jurisdiction? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just say to the member opposite that. The fact is, when we came into office, the electricity system in this province was degraded, it had been neglected, yes. it was in no shape to deliver reliable power to people across this province, Mr. Speaker. Ten thousand kilometers of transmission line have been rebuilt and repaired, Mr. Speaker, because that party did not put the money into infrastructure that was needed, Mr. Speaker. So we have done that work. We have made those investments, and we are aware, Mr. Speaker, that there's a cost associated with that. And so I hope that the member opposite, I hope the member opposite is very pleased at the plan that we announced. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order, as will the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Carry on, please. The Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, that in fact addresses Answer. the fact that people on low income are struggling in many cases and they need a break, and that's what that program Business will provide them, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Back to the Premier. Premier, you know that the primary reason hydro bills are going up is because of your Green Energy Act and its intermittent, and expensive energy. Your announcement last week about the stipend you'll be giving to low-income energy consumers is nothing more than a shell game. Almost every ratepayer is struggling to pay their bills because, under your watch, hydro bills have gone up more than tripled since 2003. People have no, no faith in your ability to administer this sliding-scale shell game. As the Ombudsman investigation clearly shows, your team can't even get a simple residential bill right, even though you've wasted $2 billion on your smart meter fiasco. Premier, how much more bureaucracy will be needed to administer this new convoluted program, and how much more will that cost the energy ratepayers of this province? Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Ontario Electricity Support Program is designed specifically to help people who have the lowest income in the province and who are struggling, Mr. Speaker, and I think that is, that is exactly the kind of support that needs to be put in place. The fact is, we took a dirty electricity system, Mr. Speaker, we shut down the coal-fired plants, we've rebuilt the system, we've made the investments that were needed, Mr. Speaker, and so we're dealing with a clean energy regime now in Ontario. The other thing that we've done, Mr. Speaker, is we have read The member from Lanark will come to order. You're, you're inches away. I can hear it. Jim, do something about that. Carry on. Speaker, we created agreements like the Samsung agreement that will actually save $3.7 billion. We've changed the domestic content rules, Mr. Speaker. We are working with Quebec an off-peak, on-peak agreement, Mr. Speaker, that will allow us to get clean power from Quebec, Mr. Speaker, at a time when they need it, and send Thank our you. power to them when they need it, Mr. Speaker. So we've taken Thank a system that was not reliable. Thank you. Final supplementary. Premier, you're always congratulating yourself on how egalitarian you are, but the hydro system you've created is anything but fair and equal. As revealed by the Sunshine List, salaries for staff at the energy sector are rising sharply. 77% of Hydro One employees and 80% of OPG employees made over $100,000 last year. At the same time, 
ratepayers have seen their salaries Minister last year, and 300,000 people in the manufacturing sector don't have a paycheck at all. Yep. Because of your economic mismanagement and, the, and Ontario's anemic growth since your party took power. Premier, it is your duty to ensure there is balance in the system between the remuneration of employees and the consumer's ability to pay. Ratepayers cannot afford to wait any longer. Will you live up to your own rhetoric, Question. scrap the Green Energy Act, and restore some semblance of balance to our energy system? For goodness sakes, Mr. Speaker, the people he's talking about are the very people who run our nuclear plants. Do you really think that that's where we should go in terms of reducing salaries? The people who run our nuclear plants? Mr. Speaker, when we go to bed at night, we want to make sure we have the best people in the world running our energy system. Right now, when you look at people like Tom Mitchell, Considered the best of, of doing the kind of work that he does in Mayor the world. We owe it Come to the Lord. people of this province, Mr. Speaker, to ensure we have the best quality people running organizations like OPG, to ensure that those nuclear plants are safe for all Ontarians to be able to know, Mr. Speaker, we have one of the best records in the world when it comes to nuclear. That is not the place to start when it comes to cutbacks. That in this government, Mr. Speaker, will not in yes, any way sacrifice safety for the sake of, uh, Mr. Speaker, anything with regard to cutting back like the member wants. Thank you. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Will the Premier be introducing a salary cap on public CEOs, and uh, what will that cap be, Speaker? Thank you, well, Mr. Speaker, as the, uh, as the member opposite knows, although she voted against the Act, the Accountability Act will bring in hard caps for, uh, for senior executives in the broader public sector, Mr. Speaker, and I think that the member opposite recognizes that. And In fact, um, my understanding is that uh, she also understands that there, there would be some exceptions. And In fact, an amendment that the NDP brought forward uh, was this. A compensation framework may provide that specified designated executives positions may receive compensation in excess of the limit." Unquote. So I think the member opposite understands that having hard caps is very important, having a range of salaries at all of those levels is important, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure that uh, she will work with us on making sure those are put in place. Thank you. Energy bills have tripled, and energy CEOs are turning into millionaires in this province. Students in Ontario pay the highest tuition in the country, and there are university presidents who are just shy of making a million dollars. The Premier is firing nurses, and there are hospital CEOs making over $800,000 a year. Can the Premier justify those salaries to Ontarians who can't pay their hydro bills? to Ontarians paying student loans for decades after they finish their post-secondary studies, or to Ontarians with a loved one who's stuck waiting for the care that they so desperately need. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I know that the, uh, the leader of the third party understands that we have to tackle all of those challenges. It's absolutely imperative that we support people who need services in this province, and we do that in the best way possible, Mr. Speaker. I know she also knows that we agree that there need to be caps on CEO salaries. That's why we have moved on that. That's why we brought the Accountability Act into place, Mr. Speaker, and that those, those caps are going to be put in place, Mr. Speaker, but there will be a range. And and the, in terms of the expertise that is needed in particular sectors, we also have to understand that that's always going to be the case, that there will be specific expertise that's needed in sectors. And as the uh, member of economic development was saying, in terms of running our nuclear plants, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the expertise that is needed, the technical expertise yes, that's needed, we're going to have to make sure that we have the right people doing those jobs and that we pay them adequately but not exorbitantly. Thank you. Speaker, the Liberals have been promising to cap CEO salaries for over a decade in this province, but they have voted against capping CEO pay three times in this legislature. When is the Premier going to put our money where her mouth is and tell the public sector CEOs that enough is enough? Treasury Board. Speaker, I have to say I'm a bit uh, mystified because we actually have passed legislation that will take exactly those steps. The NDP did not support Bill 8. We passed Bill 8, and I'm very pleased that it received royal assent. 
on December 11, 2014. So we are moving forward on the uh, executive compensation, Speaker. We are being thoughtful about it, and we are moving forward to collect the information, creating salary bans, including hard cap, Speaker. This work is underway now. We're well on our way, and I'm just a bit astonished that the leader of the third party doesn't even know that we passed that legislation. Thank you. Your question, the leader of the third Speaker, party. my next question is for the Premier. Yeah. Nurses are being fired across Ontario, and Health Quality Ontario says that more than half of Ontarians can't actually see their doctor when they get sick. But hospital CEOs are making over $800,000 a year. Putting health care first, first means making some tough choices and setting some priority, Speaker. Why is the Premier choosing hospital CEOs when she should be choosing patients? Mr. Speaker, we're not, and the, uh, the fact is that there are thousands more doctors in this province. I think it's 96 per cent of people have access at this point to, uh, to a primary care physician, Mr. Speaker, and we've made a commitment to that being 100 per cent. There are 24,000 more nurses in this province, Mr. Speaker, than when we came into office. The health care system is, is undergoing a transformation. There's no doubt about that. More care is moving into the community. There's no doubt about that, and that is a transition, Mr. Speaker. But the fact is, we have put in place legislation that will cap salaries. That legislation has passed. The NDP did not support it, Mr. Speaker, but nonetheless, that legislation is going forward and those caps will be put in place. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, our hydro bills are paying the CEO salaries of public hydro companies. Two executives particularly are making over a million dollars each. Now, I think these priorities are backwards, Speaker. The hydro system should be working for us, not the other way around. And as long as Ontarians own our hydro companies, we can say that enough is enough, uh, even though this Liberal government seems to, th to think that the status quo is fine. But if the Premier sells off Hydro One, Ontario's lo Ontarians lose, Speaker. We might not have any idea how much of our, heart, our rates are going uh, straight to the executive salaries. And if Liberals sell it off, Ontarians can't say enough is enough uh, to those executives, Speaker. Privatizing Hydro One might be good for executives, but it's bad for rates. Payers. Will the Premier pull the plug on selling Hydro One Questions? so CEO salaries will stay transparent in the province of Ontario? So let's be clear, Mr. Speaker, about what the leader of the third party is actually asking. She's saying stop the review of the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario. She's saying don't reinvest the money that we might be able to realize, the benefit we might be able to realize. Don't reinvest that in infrastructure that's needed for the 21st century, Mr. Speaker. And she's saying don't build transit and transportation infrastructure, roads and bridges that are needed across this province, because she actually doesn't agree with making any change, Mr. Speaker, that would allow us to do that. Well, I say to the leader of the third party, that is not where we're going to go. We are going to make those investments. We ran on that plan, Mr. Speaker. It is the right plan for the future of this province. It is the right plan for the economic development of communities across this province, and we're going to make those investments. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier is cutting health care, she's closing schools, and she's selling off public hydro companies, all because she says the cupboard is bare. Well, if the cupboard is bare, Speaker, why are there millionaires on the Sunshine List? I would ask the leader of the third party how she construes the building of 725 schools since we've been in office and repairs to 700 more as closing schools, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Because the fact is, across this province, we have invested in infrastructure, in hospitals, in schools, in the renovation and consolidation of schools that allow for programs to be delivered in a way that makes the best sense for kids in communities across Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We've worked with local school boards in order to do that, and those decisions have been made. And they're not easy decisions. I understand that. Every time there's a change, I've been a school trustee. I know how difficult it is to make a change in the configuration of schools in a province. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, we have to do it in the most thoughtful way possible. We have to work to create Answer. hubs where we can, Mr. Speaker, and we have to make sure that kids have access from kindergarten right through post-secondary to the best programs in the, in the world, Mr. Speaker.
New question, the member from Lanark, 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 and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, in 2009, your WSIB slush fund was first flagged as underperforming and returning little value. These suspicions were raised once again in 2012 concerning the value of this fund. And again, last year, a KPMG audit recommended that the program be shut down as it provides zero value for money. Zero. Minister, last week you told this House that by 2016 these programs will be corrected. Minister, we know the Premier's Chief of Staff, Tom Tian, made almost $350,000 at the WSIB last year. Is he the reason it takes seven years to shut down a slush fund in Liberal Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Well, Speaker, on this side of the House, we take worker health and safety very, very seriously. We bring a business practice to it. I think it's something we can be proud of. This is a program that was bought in in 1990. It's been oh. here for a long time, Speaker. It funds several organizations. It funds the OFL. They help training on claims managing for those people, for those organizations, so that they can help the workers that need to avail themselves of the system, the, uh, the navigation skills or the assistance to get through that system. In 2012, shortly after new leadership took over, we conducted an audit, like we should, on programs in so government. We found out there were some improvements we could make. We implemented those improvements. We told the employers that this would be a transition year, and we're implementing it in 2016. Speaker, we've handled this responsibly. The WSIB has handled it responsibly. Uh, I think answer. something that Ontarians should have confidence in this system, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Uh, since questioning your WSIB slush fund, Minister, to the Ontario Federation of Lab Labour, I received several letters from union leaders across the province. When I received form letters from union leaders rather than real stories from injured workers, I have no doubt that this program is nothing more than a slush fund. Minister, not one beneficiary of this program has contacted my office. However, many union officials have, but not one single injured worker. Minister, since I haven't received a single letter of support for the grant from injured workers, I'll ask you, have you received any letters of support from injured workers? And if so, will you share them with me in this House? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, as, as I mentioned in the previous answer, this is a grants program that's managed by the WSIB. It funds those organizations in this province that assist us in dealing with the issues that surround injured workers, the return to work, or train for new employment. When I hear about the Randy Hillier Slush Fund, Speaker, that is not what this is. The Randy Hillier Slush Fund may be something else that I'm unaware of, but after the audit was conducted, we made changes to the system. It was obviously, it was obviously um, some changes that could be made to improve things for injured workers in the province of Ontario, Speaker. Since the Auditor General's report in 2009, We've seen a transformation at the WSIB. It's a good news story that we share with the people of the province of Ontario because we know that injured workers, employers, and those employees are now getting the services they should be under this plan, Speaker. Um, in some of the repartee I've been hearing, it's getting dangerously close to getting extremely personal. And uh, the advice I've given since the beginning and I will adhere to today is you address individuals in this place by either their title or their writing. That tends to help. The second part to that is it's also getting dangerously close uh, to making accusations that would be unparliamentary. And stay away from it. And, I, and I'm not asking for any comments from anybody at this moment. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Premier seems that if she buries her head in the sand and refuses to acknowledge that the bribery scandal in Sudbury exists, if she says over and over and over that what happened out there doesn't matter in here, that if she wishes for it hard enough to go away, that she will make it true, but ignoring an issue, Speaker, does not make it go away. My question is quite simple. When did the Premier call first Mr. Jerry Lougheed, then Mrs. Pat Sorbara, in order for them to call Mr. Andrew Olivier to offer him a job. So, Mr. Speaker, what I have 
actually said, just to, uh, to clarify to the member opposite, is that uh, there is an investigation going on. That investigation is taking place outside of this House, Mr. Speaker. I've been very clear in my statements in public. I've been very clear in this House over and over again, the decisions that, uh, that I made, Mr. Speaker. We're very happy to have uh, the current member of Sudbury with us on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I will continue to work with the authorities in the investigation outside of the legislature. Order. Well, Speaker, someone had to tell Mr. Jerry Lawhey to call Andrew Olivier on behalf of the Premier and op offer him a job. I know Mr. Lawhey good enough to know that it is not his style to do that kind of call without strict direction. Mr. Lawhey reported the result of his call to Mr. Olivier. Then someone had to tell Mrs. Sorbera that she needed to follow up, which she did. She called Mr. Olivier and said, and I quote, you have now been directed, asked by the leader and the premier, to make a decision to step aside to allow Glenn to have the opportunity, basically have the opportunity uncontested. The OPP said, and I quote, these references to the premier's authority threatens the appearance of the government's integrity. Mrs. Sorbera and Mr. Uh, Jerry Lawhey's action called the integrity of the government into action. Question. My question, Speaker, why is the Premier letting that happen? Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And uh, again, I remind the member opposite, as the Premier just did, that uh, there is an active investigation that is going on outside uh, this legislature. Premier, by uh, by no means, is uh, avoiding. Uh, the issue, what she's doing is respecting the process, a process that is independent uh, than what happens uh, in the legislature or what the government does. And I think, uh, Speaker, we should all respect that process. Uh, the member opposite knows very well that uh, the Premier or any member of the government cannot interfere and interject in the process. In fact, even the Chief Electoral Officer Speaker said in his report that I'm neither deciding to prosecute a matter nor determining anyone's guilt or innocence. Those decisions are respective, respectively for prosecutors and judges. Speaker, as I've said earlier before, Answer. none of us are here in this legislature are prosecutors or judges. They are independent roles. We should respect those roles and we let Thank those you. individuals do their job. Thank you, Speaker. New question, the member from Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister, constituents in my riding of Sudbury are concerned about changes to Ontario's moose hunt that your ministry is proposing. An article in a local newspaper stated, and I quote, Ontario hunters are up in arms over a plan to shorten the moose season, which they argue goes far above and beyond what's necessary to sustain viable populations. Speaker, moose hunting is a proud part of our heritage and an important part of Ontario's economy. In fact, recreational fishing and hunting provide more than $4 billion to our economy each year. In many small businesses in our province, several of which are in my riding, rely on hunting and fishing tourism to support their economic viability. Minister, my constituents are concerned about what impact these changes will Question. have on their lives and their livelihoods. Through you, Mr. Speaker, could the minister explain to my constituents why his ministry is proposing changes thank you. to the moose hunt? Minister, Ms. Speaker, thank you very much. I want to thank the, uh, the member for the question, and he's right, Speaker. There are a number of people and groups out there who are alarmed by what's coming forward. But I would say, in fact, that many of the people that are most affected by the changes we're bringing forward are the people that get it the most, who understand that the sustainability of this population is what's most apparent, uh, important. In fact, I would say in my community of Thunder Bay, there are people that are telling me absolutely to shut the hunt down. No. Speaker, it's taken years to get to this situation, and it's going to take us some time to fix it, but I'm not going to kick the can down the road. We need to make some decisions, and we need to we need to make sure that we get this absolutely right. What these groups and these people uh, don't agree on is what steps need to be taken to fix this particular problem. But what these people and these groups agree on is that steps need to be taken. Speaker, I'm going to take those steps. New numbers are in. They, can, they continue to be not good. There's more coming forward. Uh, but, Speaker, we have to make some decisions. We have to fix a problem that's taken years to create. We're going to get it right. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for recognizing the important role that the moose hunt plays in our economy and in the North. And in the Sudbury area, Mr. Speaker, tourist outfitters rely on their ability to provi provide a variety of hunting and fishing opportunities. 
Outfitters like Lying Lake Resort in nearby Espanola, Espanola, for example, rely on moose hunting tourism for their business. These outfitters bring tourists from all parts of the province into the Sudbury area and support our local economy. Mr. Speaker, with these changes to moose season, businesses and members of my community want to know how these changes will impact them. Everyone agrees that we need to ensure our moose population is sustainable for future generations. But I'm hearing from some of my constituents that there may be other opinions about how to move forward with the moose hunt. Question. Hunters, tourist outfitters, and the public all want to ensure that we are making the right changes to Ontario's moose hunt. So can the minister talk about how he's going to protect the economic interests of our moose thank you. population without the north? Minister. Speaker, again, I thank the, uh, the member for the question. In the phase one consultation, Speaker, most of the work that we did focused on the resident hunter and the tourist outfitter. The member is very correct in saying that. And that's one of the criticisms that the ministry has historically received. We're only looking at the tag allocation for the resident hunter and for the tourist outfitter. Phase two will change that. I've made a very clear uh, commitment to the groups that are interested in this issue that the phase two consultations that will begin very soon will look at other opportunities to sustain this population that just doesn't manage the hunter. In the phase one piece that we did, we worked very hard last year to ensure that tourist outfitters, those people that have made a private sector investment whose livelihood depends on this to a large degree, weren't negatively affected. We kicked the numbers back a number of times to the ministry and said it wasn't good enough. The flying's been done. We've invested in Answer. new aerial inventories. The numbers are not good. There's more information coming soon. Phase two will take a broader look at how we're going to try and sustain this population. Question the member from the Thank Park. you very much. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. On April 15, 2014, the Premier filed a lawsuit against the member for Niagara West Glanbrook and me for questioning her involvement in the cover up of deleted emails in the gas plant scandal. The next day, on April 16, 2014, the members for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke and Simcoe North referred to the suit as a slap or nuisance suit during debate on the Public Participation Act. That same day, the anti-slap bill was also sent to die in committee. At the time, the bill had a retroactivity clause. Former Attorney General John Gerritsen said, quote, the rule will apply to suits before the bill comes into force, thus allowing for the dismissal of strategic litigation. Did the Premier kill the anti-slap bill the day after she launched the lawsuit because it would affect her attempt to motion Question. the opposition? No, we didn't, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Attorney General is going to want to speak to this, but uh, you know, I think the uh, I think the member opposite knows that uh, that retroactive rulemaking is not something that is. Uh, seen favorably by the courts. It's not something that, uh, that we uh, have engaged in, Mr. Speaker. And to the, to the issue of the, uh, the suit that, uh, that I brought, Mr. Speaker, I have been very clear all along that uh, I believe that debating substance is important. I think debating the truth is important, Mr. Speaker, but allegations that are completely baseless, that are not, uh, that are not uh, based in any uh, accurate assessment of a situation, Mr. Speaker, I don't think, I don't think that that is uh, right. And, and I have said all along that uh, uh, I would always debate the truth, but uh, untruth I'm not interested in. Answer. Thank you. That's quite a statement. It's also quite a coincidence. The lawsuit was launched on the 15th of April. She decided to kill that bill off on the 16th. The previous two incarnations of the bill had the retroactivity clause until it didn't suit the Premier. On December 1, 2014, the Public Participation Act was reintroduced, again for the third time uh, without this clause. John Gerritsen says about this submission, quote, obviously the bill is weaker, quote, it probably shouldn't be gone. The Premier must know how this looks. It appears she killed her own law for her own political gain. This is on the heels of her role in the canceled gas plants and, most recently, the Sudbury bri bribery uh, scandal. She thinks she's above the law, and if the law doesn't suit her, she change it. Is there any length this Premier of Ontario won't go to cling to power? 
You know, Mr. Speaker, I would, uh, I would say to the member opposite um, that uh, we're very, we very committed to the anti-slap legislation. We have been all along, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the retroactivity, I think, was a concern. In terms of, in terms of the other issue, Mr. Speaker, you know, if, uh, if the, the two members would just apologize, Mr. Speaker, the whole thing would go away. That's, that's all we're talking about. All I, all I was concerned about was that there was a, a completely unfounded Order. allegation, Mr. Speaker. The accusations were made on the eve of an election. Uh, they were completely untrue, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker. They were a complete fiction. And all I'm saying is that just apologize, retract those, Mr. Speaker, and the whole thing goes away. Good question. The member from Toronto, Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Last week, we asked the Premier to provide a guarantee that hydro rates wouldn't go up as a result of her plan to privatize Hydro One. We didn't get an answer. In fact, the Minister of Energy said last week he had no idea how Hydro One would be managed if it was privatized. If the government has no idea how Hydro One would be managed, how can the government prevent costs from going up? Well, Mr. Premier. Speaker, I don't have the transcript in front of me, but I think the Ma Minister of Energy was probably saying that you didn't have any idea how the uh, the uh, hydro one would be managed. Yeah. But, Mr. Speaker, what I know is that this line of questioning um, intensified on the very day that we announced the Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, which is a program to uh, give some relief to the lowest income citizens in this province, Mr. Speaker, lowest income residents. I would have thought that the NDP would have been concerned, Mr. Speaker, and would have been supportive of such a program. I know that they're not supportive, Mr. Speaker, of making a change in our assets. I know they're not supportive of investing in transportation infrastructure, in transit and roads and bridges across the province, Mr. Speaker. I don't know why they're not supportive of that, but they're not supportive, Mr. Speaker. But I would have thought Answer. that they would have support, been supportive of a program that would help the lowest income residents in this province, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, last week we learned that the CEO of Hydro One last year earned more than three and a half times as much money as the Premier herself. The government has done a poor job at controlling executive salaries. True. But if Hydro One is privatized, the government will have even less control over executive salaries and less control over hydro costs. How can the government control executive salaries and hydro costs of Economic when it's giving up oversight? and control with this misguided privatization scheme. So, Mr. Speaker, this whole gambit and this whole debate would would be much um it would be much more rational if the NDP actually had a plan for any of this. If they had a plan to build transit, Mr. Speaker, if they had a plan for the electricity system. You know, the National Post on March 6, 2014, talked about the energy plan so-called the NDP put forward, and the National Post said that the NDP's energy plan veers straight into crazy talk, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that there is no consistency in terms of what the NDP is asking for, Mr. Speaker. They haven't put forward a co coherent plan, neither for an electricity system that would be reliable and affordable, nor for investments in transit that would give us a 21st century infrastructure yes, that we need across the province. Until they have those plans, Mr. Speaker, it's pretty hard to debate with any kind of uh, credibility. Thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, in my riding of Etobicoke Centre, we have one of the highest percentages of seniors of any riding in Canada. And I've heard from many of those seniors, and they've expressed to me how important it is that they have access to home and community care as they age. I've also spoken to many people in my riding who are not seniors but who are caring for seniors, people who are caring for their elderly parents while also caring for their children and raising a family, and often with, with limited resources. And they've asked me for help, they've asked us for help to ensure that they can access the home and community care that they need to support their, their aging parents. And to weather this challenge, to address this challenge, it's obviously important that we continue to deliver high quality home and community care um, for the people of, of Ontario. Minister, could you specifically outline what work your ministry is doing to ensure access to high-quality community and home care in communities like Etobicoke Centre? Thank you. Mr. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Centre for this uh, very important question. I'm pleased to tell you how our government is improving health care for seniors with complex health conditions across Ontario. Uh, I was pleased to be at Toronto Rehab last week to make an announcement that our government is investing more than $40 million in specialized rehabilitative care right across the province to help our seniors recover from illnesses and injuries so that they can continue to live independently at home. This is a program called Assess and Restore, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, most of Ontario's 1.9 million seniors are healthy and use the health care system only occasionally, but a small number of our seniors living in the community, about 150,000 or 8 percent of them, have complex care needs, and this program is geared specifically towards them. We know that sometimes long hospital stays can Answer. result in debilitation or muscle loss, weakened bones. For too many seniors, that means moving into long-term care long-term care home prematurely. This program, program aims to allow them to continue living independently. Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Strong community-based care is not only a preferred method of care for many seniors, as they can remain in their homes and out of hospitals, but it obviously also provides relief to families. It's also a much cheaper form of care than the hospital-based care that is often the alternative. My constituents, and particularly seniors in Etobicoke Centre, have also been asking me about physiotherapy. Um, this is a service that's critical to many of people in my community, and my understanding is the government's working to improve services in a number of ways. And I've heard about things such as one-on-one -on -one physiotherapy for long-term care residents with assessed need, um, enhanced access to exercise and fall prevention classes for seniors in community settings, and expanded in-home and clinic-based physiotherapy for seniors. Services like this that are based in the community go a long way in helping families as they juggle that challenge I raised earlier of caring for aged loved ones while also raising a family. Minister, could you please tell the House more about the work that you are doing Question. to strengthen physiotherapy access across Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Well, thank you to the member again. And uh, Part of my announcement last week, I was also able to say and announce that Ontario is expanding access to physiotherapy into primary health care settings across the province by investing more than $4.2 million to add physiotherapy services across 25 more family health teams, nurse practitioner-led clinics, and community health centres. So an estimated 71,000 people, including seniors, will now be able to access physiotherapy at the same place where they receive their primary care health health services. So improving health outcomes for seniors is also part of the government's plan to build a better Ontario through its Patients First Action Plan for health care. By providing patients with faster access to the right care, better home and community care, the information that they need to stay healthy, and a health care system that's sustainable Answer. for generations to come. Providing seniors with more supports will allow them to live safely and independently at home and enjoy a better quality of life. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. My question is from Bruce and Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, last week you not only defended your broken social assistance computer program, you proclaimed it a success. You told the House, and I quote, at the end of the day, we have been extremely successful." End of quote. Wow. Mr. Speaker, I am sure the people waiting in line at social assistance offices and the frontline staff working overtime to clear the logjam would disagree. Minister, do you have any concern that your high-priced consultants will share your confidence about SAMS when they produce their preliminary report tomorrow? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, uh, we have been successful in terms of the fact that we have ensured that we've processed four successful pay runs for both ODSP and OW monthly payments, payments to some 570,000 families each month. This is our priority. So we have made some two and a half million payments to our most vulnerable families in total. And of course, I want to thank all the staff that are working so very hard on the front line lines to ensure that this is happening. I know that they have had a number of frustrations, but actually the production of these checks has been uh, a wonderful step forward for all those vulnerable families that rely on these payments, and uh, we have accommodated uh, them uh, in the way uh, that we have with all this uh, hard work and the number of the improvements that we have made yes, to date on SAMS. 
Thank you. Supplementary. Here. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the minister. The fact is, this minister's testimony continues to be at critical odds with the facts. It's clear that if Sands was working as intended, there would be no need to keep funneling millions into the system, nor to hire consultants to mitigate a mess so big that the government's entire IT department could not fix it. Minister, the preliminary report is scheduled to come out tomorrow. Will you, in the spirit of government openness and transparency, make the report publicly available upon its release? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, yes, indeed, I'm looking forward to this uh, report from our uh, third-party technical advisor, uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers. I understand will be delivering this week uh, this report. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing those results. We will certainly be communicating the, the themes that we hear in that report. It is an interim report. Uh, they have been engaging with stakeholders across the province. I attended a meeting uh, with frontline workers and PricewaterhouseCoopers to ensure that the issues that were important to the people using the system were being fully communicated to PricewaterhouseCoopers. I look forward not only to this interim report, but of course to the final report that that I'm sure we'll have a far more fulsome uh, response to it, the issues around Sanders. Thank you. No question. No from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, with the release of the Sunshine List, Londoners were stunned to learn that the president of Western University made almost $1 million last year, more than double his annual salary. He is the fourth highest uh, paid public sector employee in the province because of a deal negotiated with Western's Board of Governors for twice his salary in lieu of administrative leave. With the university cutting staff and increasing class sizes, this double payout is a slap in the face to Western students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the community. Premier, will your government step in to prohibit university boards of governors from negotiating similar double payouts to university presidents? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to investing in our, in our young people. That's that's why we have been investing heavily in our universities and colleges over the past 11 years, 12 years, Mr. Speaker. In the meantime, Mr. Speaker, we know that Ontarians, they have all the right to make sure that their tax dollars are spent properly. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we have brought the Accountability Act, which has been passed last year and received, uh, and received royal assent in December. Mr. Speaker, in the meantime, we have frozen the executive salaries and we expect firmly that members that were brought the public sector executives, they, they, uh, they follow the, the, the freeze and salaries and wages, which we have introduced, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Speaker, the president of Western is not the only senior university administrator among the top ten. The president and CEO of University of Toronto Asset Management Corp is in third place at a time when the university claimed to be unable to pay teaching assistants more than poverty wages, forcing grad students and TAs to strike for fairness and recognition of their rights. Speaker, Ontario students are among the fastest growing group of food bank users and are already paying the highest tuition in the country. They face planned year-over-year -year increases in tuition to make up the chronic shortfall in post-secondary education funding. Premier, how can your government justify hiking tuition fees and increasing reliance on contract faculty while allowing universities to negotiate these kind of Question. salaries to senior university administrators? Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, we have invested heavily in our universities and colleges, as well as we have invested in our students, Mr. Speaker. We have introduced 30 per cent discount on tuition fee for our, young, for our students, which has been a great success, Mr. Speaker. With regard to the specific question, Mr. Speaker, uh, the president of the University of Western Ontario, he opted not taking uh, administrative leave. That's why his salary has been increased. Uh, that's our understanding. And in relation to University of Toronto, Vice President for Asset Management, there was an, an, an article in his, um, in his contract so that he can receive uh, uh, he can receive performance uh, bonuses so these are all the things which have been already existed in the contracts of those executives but as i said earlier mr speaker we have introduced accountability act we are working very hard to make yes, sure sir. that executives in the broader public sector their salaries will be frozen and will be under certain regime thank, thank you mr you. speaker the question the member from Barry. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, digital technology has become a fundamental part of our daily lives. I know that even our youngest students in JK and SK use digital technology skillfully. Being able to connect with each other online has broken down borders and offered us an amazing wealth of information right at our fingertips. But it's critical that we always think about how we can leverage this technology to benefit all Ontario students and how we can improve their learning experience and make their education more flexible and affordable. Minister, can you inform the House about our government's efforts to build a world-class post-secondary education system that is a leader in innovation Question. and online learning. Question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to say that Ontario has a strong foundation in online learning and digital learning. At the post-secondary level, Mr. Speaker, we have the highest number of online learning course registration across our country, Canada. Earlier this year, our government announced an investment of $42 million over three years, Mr. Speaker, to launch Online Ontario. Online Ontario, Mr. Speaker, is a new collaborative centre of excellence that will be available in time this year, in the September 2015-16 school year. It will help students save money as well as time, avoiding needless duplication of courses and by helping to speed up the process for those wishing to fast-track their learnings. We know that, Mr. Speaker, more accessible and uh, and user-friendly post-secondary education will help our young people to, to succeed. Here, thank here. you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. I'm glad to hear that our government is committed to driving quality and innovation in Ontario's post-secondary system. But I know that in the past, transferring post-secondary credits from one college or university to another has been a very long and difficult process for students. Many students in my riding of Barrie want the flexibility to easily transfer relevant credits between different colleges and universities in this province. Through you, Speaker, to the Minister. Can you inform the members of the House on how our government is improving credit transfer opportunities for Ontario students? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, thank you for the member for, for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to giving students more flexibility and choice when it comes to post-secondary education. We are doing this by increasing credit transfer opportunities for our students, Mr. Speaker, and introducing new tools to help students become more mobile. Since launching the credit transfer initiatives in 2011, our government has partnered with our colleges and universities to triple the number of transferable credits available for our students. Just recently, Mr. Speaker, Colleges Ontario and the Ontario Council on Articulation and Transfer announced that business diploma students in Ontario colleges seamlessly can transfer their courses from one college to another. We are also proud, Mr. Speaker, supporting a website called ontransfer.ca, which is a real-time guide sir. for students to discover which credits they can transfer and which pathway is right for them. Our government, Mr. Speaker, will continue to work with our partners in the university and the college sector to Thank make you. sure that our students have mobility across the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. This weekend, the Globe and Mail published a story on the ROMS Crystal Project. The story highlighted a problem of accountability within the Royal Ontario Museum's Board of Governors. The, or the organization, which is a separate entity from the museum, functions much like a hospital foundation and is supposed to manage fundraising and donor recognition. In this case, however, the board in which members are appointed by your ministry was stacked with many of those whose donations were outstanding. This led to yet another secret bailout from this government. Minister, what will it take for you to step up and bring accountability to the public appointment process under your ministry, and will you admit that your lack of oversight has now forced yet another taxpayer bailout of a government agency? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to start by saying how proud I am of the work that the Royal Ontario Museum has been doing 
uh, here in Ontario, but they're a world-class museum and they're recognized uh, globally. Mr. Speaker, we have over a million people that come into Toronto Order. each year uh, to visit the Royal Ontario Museum, and our tourism sector here in the province of Ontario, which the Royal Ontario Museum is part of, because culture and tourism, that's what our museums are all about. We have contributed $28 billion uh, I mean, in Ontario uh, to help build our, our economy, and the Royal Ontario Museum is a key, uh, key Hero, part Ruth. of that. Uh, key, a key Sorry, part of that economy. Gray, Mr. Speaker, there, there is a loan that is outstanding with the Royal Ontario Museum. I'm fully convinced that the Royal Ontario Museum is on track to repay that loan, and um, I'll be able to uh, answer, give some more details in the supplemental. Thank you. Well, I'll be looking forward to those details because we didn't get any in the first uh, answer. answer. So the problem with oversight is not just with the Royal Ontario Museum Board of Governors. Before the Christmas break, I asked about the outstanding annual reports for Ontario Place. I finally received a copy of the tabled 2011 annual report three weeks ago, four years late. The Metropolitan Toronto Convention Centre Corporation annual reports have been left outstanding for years at a time, and last Friday it was revealed that four waiters are listed on the Sunshine List, what? making over $100,000 a year. So do you have any idea of what's going on at these agencies? They're not watching our public dollars. When are you going to take your job seriously and provide proper oversight? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In regards to the annual reports, every single annual report for my agency has been signed by me. They're in process, and uh, I'm quite confident they'll, they'll get to this legislature as soon as possible. I'll give you the fact that I was only halfway up, so that's good. I'll leave you alone on that one. Carry on, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In regards to the $249 million loan, which uh, we contributed to, the federal government contributed to, 70% of that loan has been repaid by the Royal Ontario Museum. 70%, and they are on track to pay that loan back. The Royal Ontario Museum is an incredible institution here in the province of Ontario, and I'm proud of the work that they have done and their board has done. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Premier, or excuse me, Speaker. This morning, Unifor released a report detailing the catastrophic impact that the possible closure of the GM plants in Oshawa would have on our economy, have on our community, and the province as a whole. According to the report, Ontario would experience a loss of over 30,000 jobs, and our GDP would decline by more than five billion dollars. In the meantime, this government continues to sit on its hands while our community lives with uncertainty and braces for impact. Speaker, will the Premier help to put our community at ease and commit to doing everything in her power to ensure that this scenario does not become our reality? Minister of Economic Development and Employment. Well, thank Mr. you, Mr. Economic Speaker. Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank Jim Stafford and uh, I want to thank Jerry Diaz and Unifor for their leadership in bringing forward this report. And yes, indeed, we know, and, and, and they, they are confirming that, it, that Oshawa really does mean tens of thousands of jobs, billions upon billions of dollars of economic development uh, and, and, and impact on our GDP. And that's why we're working tirelessly, Mr. Speaker, in par partnership with Unifor. Our number one priority right now is to, to ensure that the future of the GM plant in Oshawa remains bright. We have every reason to be optimistic, and Jerry Diaz would say, and did say the exact same thing this morning. We're working in partnership to make sure we do that. My hope is that that report, though, uh, makes sure that, uh, that the NDP recognize how important Answer. this is, and rather than kind of equivocating when we make these important investments, stand with us when we make these important investments. Thank you. For a change. <clears throat> Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. General Motors has been building cars in Oshawa for over a century, but in spite of our strong history, the future remains uncertain. Ontario was once a leader in the automotive industry, but under this government, our share of production continues to decline. When the government had leverage as a shareholder, they opted not to use it. When they could have been strengthening our auto sector, they've turned their back. So, Speaker, will the government make a real commitment to the automotive industry in Ontario and implement a comprehensive automotive strategy? 
Minister. Unlike the NDP, Mr. Speaker, we don't equivocate. We take action. And, Mr. Speaker, yeah, yeah. this government has invested more in the auto sector than any government in any generation before us. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to make those investments. And I'll tell you why we'll make those investments. They're working. We've seen $4 billion of investment since November in Ontario's auto sector. That's a record amount of investment. In fact, Mr. Speaker, that $4 billion represents more than we've probably seen in many years, Mr. Speaker. Things are going well in terms of our investments in the auto sector, but we're going to continue to work tirelessly to continue to land mandates. Oshawa is our number one concern, but Mr. Speaker, even GM just recently invested $560 million in Ingersoll. Good news. Honda, $857 million Answer. in Alliston. Chrysler, $2 billion in, in, in Windsor. Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep working with the Thank sector. You. We're going to keep building. Thank you. Your question, the member from Beaches, East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Good Minister. Now, Speaker, my riding of Beaches, East York, is home to numerous forward-thinking small businesses. Constituents like Cal Bruner of Caseware, a world-leaning software company, are proud of the contributions they're making to Ontario's economy and to a stronger province as a whole. And the Minister of Government and Consumer Services, your mandate is to deliver effective procurement practices that ensure the best value for the money and the guarantee of transparent, accountable investments. And I personally think many of the businesses in my riding would form productive mutual benefit agreements with our government. Speaker, will the minister speak to opportunities that may exist for not only the large businesses, but small and medium-sized businesses to engage our government? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And I want to uh, thank the member from Beaches East York for the question and for raising this important issue. I certainly share my colleagues' confidence in Ontario businesses, and our government continues to provide opportunities, whether it be building roads or developing software or providing maintenance equipment. Participation in provincial procurement is open to all qualified vendors, regardless of size or location, through our Vendor of Record program. In fact, the vast majority of businesses we deal with are small and medium-sized Ontario businesses. Our investment reflects both quality and competitiveness of Ontario vendors, and in 2013-14, the stats reveal that 89% of all procurement payments were made to Ontario vendors. It's a great program, Speaker, and I'm happy to follow up on our supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for informing us about these numerous opportunities for agreements with the Ontario government. I realize that these agreements are, serve multiple purposes, delivering efficient and effective services while providing excellent opportunities for local entrepreneurs. It is equally important that taxpayers are assured that goods and services are procured through a fair and competitive and user-friendly process that benefits all Ontarians. And I understand that the Ministry of Government and Consumer Service has worked to simplify bidding processes for invest interested vendors, making sure all postings are visible and easy to access. These types of initiatives reduce time and effort required for vendors to bid on procurement opportunities. Will the Minister of Government and Community Services explain to the House how simplified bidding processes work effectively with vendors? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and again to the member from uh, Beaches East York, and thank you for the question. Streamlining the application process is, uh, is very important, and we have uh, carefully ensured that our vendor uh, perspectives are considered in this process. After consulting extensively, we've created a shorter, simpler procurement uh, documents that are standardized uh, with uh, appropriate conditions, and I've streamlined the process. In fact, Ontario is the first government in Canada to move to a fully electronic tendering system. While vendors used to be charged for assessing procurement opportunities, they can now download these documents free of charge, and using electronic tendering has received positive feedback from the vendor community. Our uh, system improves notifications that help reduce the number of incomplete bids, eliminates the cost of printing and shipping uh, materials, and we've added uh, form-based evaluations that allow officials Answer. to complete more procurement in less time. Speaker, I'm certainly pleased with the progress with respect to the procurement and our vendor of record program. Thank you. The member from Edmonton Lawrence yeah, point of order, on Mr. a point Speaker. of order. I seek unanimous consent to have a moment's silence for the two construction workers who died on the job last week in Toronto. A member from Eglinton Lawrence is seeking unanimous consent to have a moment of silence in honour of the two construction workers uh, killed in Toronto on site. 
Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. I would ask all members of the House to please rise for a moment of silence to pay our respects. Thank you for that kind gesture. The member for Cambridge on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I just wanted to introduce today the uh, grandparents of the page from Cambridge, Alicia Berg. Her grandparents, Donna and Howard Pham, join us this morning. So welcome to Queen's Park. The member from Davenport on a point of order. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to the legislature uh, Kevin Toda, who is uh, visiting here from McGill University of Montreal. He's a political science student who has come here today to listen to question period. Welcome. Thank you. The member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Point Mr. Of order. Speaker. I would like to draw attention to the fact that both Lisa McLeod and Christine Elliott are celebrating their ninth anniversary today and coming to Queen's Park. Thank you. Happy anniversary. <laughs> there are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>